All right. Now, this is kind of a, a Bible study within a Bible study, because if you remember the, how everything got started here with Sunday evenings as we were going through the book of Daniel, and then we were getting into so much material that dealt with the tribulation that we took a step off of that to deal with, uh, you know, the, uh, what are the possibilities, or what does the Bible have to say, and what are the historical implications that it might be a three-and-a-half-year tribulation instead of a seven-year tribulation. And the more we begin to look at that, then we kind of narrow some things down even further, and you end up with kind of some Bible studies within Bible studies. And if you've ever you know, sat down and kind of studied through your Bible, and if you take it real slow, sometimes something will pop up while you're trying to study something else, and then you'll wind off over here, and sometimes those are your best Bible studies, is where you start off looking at one thing, and it takes you down another road, uh, and you follow that trail, and, and sometimes you wind up in some real interesting territory, and so what we're going to be looking at here this evening, and I don't know that we'll get through all of it this evening, uh, but that's what does the Bible say about the motions of the heavens that the Lord had created. Now, we ended up uh, last week uh, looking at these guys just a little bit. And the reason that this comes up is because of this guy right here, Kepler. Uh, and Kepler was an astronomer and an astrologer. And he's the one that set up some of the stuff that uh, Bible commentators and historians and different people are still using today. And he used uh, astronomy. Uh, he's the one that kind of came up, well, that, there's this, um, that there was this eclipse that happened in the days of Herod and tried to date um, the birth of Christ based on an eclipse. And uh, Kepler's mom was a witch, and he was in astrology and all this other stuff. And so you start to look at some of the things that he was coming up with, and is this a guy that we really truly want to uh, get our Bible you know, our Bible dates and years and all that from? Probably not. Uh, but in addition to him, you also wind up uh, with these couple of guys, and these are some names that you're probably maybe a touch more familiar with, which is Copernicus and Galileo. But all three of these guys were the first to propagate in their time uh, some scientific and astronomical theories that ran contrary to the Bible. And what you'll hear taught throughout history is that uh, guys like Galileo and Copernicus and these guys, they were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church for teaching that the uh, earth went around the sun instead of what everybody had believed up to that point, which was that the sun went around the earth. And so everybody looks back and, okay, well, that was just old religiosity, and that was just, you know, just religion dictating how the heavens worked. Um, but the person that was uh, putting a lot of that together, the astronomy, uh, showing that the sun went around the earth, was a guy by the name of Tycho Bray, who was an astronomer, that this guy poisoned and then took his position and showed pictures of him and things like that. But um, you ought to begin to pray about uh, the facts that, uh, the, and here's the thing, Copernicus, Copernicus was a Roman Catholic. Uh, and so was Kepler, and they're accredited with the world accepting the idea that the earth revolves around the sun. Uh, the saved Tycho Bray painstakingly recorded exact astronomical calculations to show otherwise, and when Kepler wanted to use Bray's uh, huge calculations uh, to put for his own laws of planetary motion, he poisoned Bray using mercury and took his job as the court astronomer in 1601. So there's some, some interesting things that kind of go along with some of this. Um, let's see. Um, but here's just some information before we kind of get into the scripture references. Um, these are the scripture references that I found uh, where the Bible talks about planetary motions. And hopefully we'll find some things in here that even without what I'm going to give you here, um, as Bible believers, we shouldn't necessarily need the science. Right, Because the Bible is so far ahead of science that it, science has got to catch up with the Bible. And so even if there's no science out there saying that the, um, that the sun goes around the earth, uh, we ought to look and see what the Bible says. Now, in the end, just so we're clear at the beginning of this, is, does, you can disagree with all of this. Does it change salvation? 
Does it change the Lord coming back? Does it change dispensations? Does it change any of those things? No. So you don't have to agree with anything that I'm saying here. There is, um, um, there's preachers that, um, that uh, I respect highly that disagree with my position here. And this, so this doesn't have to be your position. We're not talking about doctrine. Okay? But what has been interesting, and is not commonly reported, is that the reason that we... Here... Uh, use something like this, right? There's your solar system and all the planets and everything the way that you're taught in school and how they rotate and all go around. And the reason that that teaching, the, the explanation for that teaching is that, this, uh, that gravity is based upon mass, right? And the, the most mass object in our solar system is the sun, and so because it has the most mass, that everything is going to rotate around it. It's going to draw everything in, but velocity is going to keep it spinning outside and never being brought in. Um, and so the whole principle of our solar system is made up because of the principles of gravity and what, you know, what we claim to know about gravity. But here's the interesting thing about gravity is that they're now discovering that they don't know about gravity what they are telling you that they know about gravity. So you can look some things up. That's all I did. Uh, is look it up and see what scientists are saying about gravity because right now what they're saying is that we don't know much. Okay, So I'll read you some things here. It says, gravity is something all of us are familiar with from our first childhood experiences. You drop something, it falls. And the way physicists have described gravity has also been pretty consistent. It's considered one of the four main forces of interactions of, natural, uh, sorry, of nature and how it works uh, has been described by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity all the way back in 1915, so this stuff has been around for a while. But Professor Eric Verlin, an expert in string theory from the University of Amsterdam and the Delta Institute of Theoretical Physics, thinks that gravity is not a fundamental force of nature because it's not always there. They're finding that gravity isn't always there. Um, instead, it's emergent, coming into existence from changes in microscopic bits of information in the structure of space-time. So it's not there where it should be. It's not there where they expect to find it. Verlinde first articulated this groundbreaking theory in 2010, which took on the laws of Newton and argued that gravity is an intro, uh, entropic force caused by changes in the information associated with the positions of material bodies. He famously stated then that gravity is an illusion elaborating further that, well, of course, gravity is not an illusion in the sense that we know that things fall. Most people, certainly in physics, think that we can describe gravity perfectly adequately using Einstein's general relativity. But it now seems that we can also start from a microscopic formulation where there is no gravity to begin with, but you can derive it. This is called emergence. One way the existence of dark matter uh, was used was to explain why stars in outer regions of space seem to rotate faster around the center of their galaxy than theory suggested. What Verlin proposes is that gravity just works differently from how we previously understood it and creating the concept of dark matter is irrelevant. And you go on and you end up with something called quantum gravity. And one of the many issues is that gravity isn't really force like other forces are. Gravity is all about space-time, and space-time is the stage on which all the particles strut their stuff as the actors. And um, he says, if you're a topical expert researcher, or no, no, sorry, the in, uh, but what they get into is that they find that the, uh, that the variables involving gravity are too many. Uh, in the normal, what he calls QFT world, that stage, or that quantum field, uh, that stage stays fixed and unmoving throughout eternity, uh, allowing us to focus on all the interactions uh, innately. But general relativity tells us that the stage is alive. Interesting. It bends and warps under the influence of the actors, and that bending and warping redirects the actors' motions. And when we look back at our basic electron-photon interaction under a quantum field picture, we start to get migraines. 
we have to take into account not only every possible combination and permutation of photons and electrons interacting, but also all possible configurations of space-time underneath them. So what they find out is that there's so many variables that they can't predict gravity. It doesn't work the way that they expect it to work. It's not there when they expect to find it. Um, it says, you may have heard of the graviton, which is uh, the particle that carries gravity. But that concept comes from trying to point, or uh, comes from trying to paint gravity with quantum mechanical colors, and we know that simply doesn't work, at least not yet. Until further notice, there simply isn't a real thing uh, you can point to and say, that's a graviton. What is the ultimate resolution? We know we live in a quantum world, but we can't figure out a way to describe gravity without swearing. And that is infinitely annoying. That's what they have, that's what scientists are saying about gravity, is that they can't figure it out. All right, so let's look and see what the Bible says. All right, let's start with uh, Psalms. Now, here's the thing, and I'll get into this probably later, but all of this, all of this, and all of this, these are pictures, but they're, they're art is what they are. Now, this one you can tell is art, but if you Google image, you know, you go, you Google search, um, picture of the Milky Way galaxy, you'll get this. Looks real, doesn't it? But here's the thing, that's art. That's not real. How do you know it's not real? Because you're in the Milky Way galaxy. How could you get a picture of it? Unless there was like a giant mirror out in outer space somewhere and you could get a reflection back of it, you can't. So every picture that they've ever shown you of the Milky Way galaxy is a lie. They surmise that we're in a spiral galaxy, and so they've drawn, they've made computer graphic pictures of spiral galaxies, and they say, well, you know, and then they tell you where you are. They say, well, you're, you're right here. And you can find pictures where they'll point and say, you are here in the Milky Way galaxy. How on earth do you know? And this image right here doesn't exist. There's no satellite that's ever sent an image back from up here somewhere looking down to get a picture of this. It's supposition. You don't have a picture of that, but you're taught that. The same way that you're taught that, uh, you know, 4,000 miles down in the heart of the earth is a giant ball of nickel, and that's how our, our, um, our you know, magnetic field and all of that stuff is supposed to work. I even though that uh, we've never dug further than 15, I don't, I don't even think it's, I think it's like seven and a half miles. The furthest that we've ever dug into the Earth's crust is something like seven miles. And yet you're going to tell me what's 4,000 miles down? But people, you know, because you have to learn it in school and, and kids are taught, hey, you've got to pass the class and you reiterate the information over and over and over and over again. You study it, you put it on flashcards, you study it for the test, you get asked the question, what's, the, what's at the core of the earth? Giant ball of nickel. What are the nine planets in order? Okay, da, 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 because, because you have to memorize it. You know, what is it, uh, my Aunt Sally or whatever it is, you, you remember the mnemonics that tell you the order of the planets and all that stuff, and it, it's ingrained, it's indoctrinated that this is how it is. It's never, it's not explained, but you have to know it because we're teaching this to you as fact. We don't have any pictures of it, but this is the fact and this is what you have to know. And that's what's taught. All right, let's go to Psalms chapter 9610 and we'll start in our search of what does the Bible have to say about these things. Now, like I said, there's some, some preachers that I highly respect that don't necessarily hold what I'm showing here as a geocentric, that means the Earth at the center of the solar system, the sun goes around it, and all the other planets go around the sun. That's what we're talking about when we talk about geocentrism. Now what I have up here are a couple of books by a guy, uh, by Professor Bo, and uh, one is called The Geocentric Primer, and the other one is uh, geocentric, uh, geocentricity, Christianity in the Woodshed. So this is a guy who's put together not only the biblical evidence, but the physics evidence to it as well. And I'll reference a couple of things as he gets into some history uh, here a little later on. Uh, Psalms chapter 96, 10. Psalms chapter 96, verse 10. 
Uh, let's see, it says here, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. So what does he say about, um, what does he say about the world? It shouldn't move. Okay, let's, uh, and it's not in my notes up here, but let's go back to Genesis and let's look at creation here for a second. Okay. Um, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so he creates the earth. All right, that's not, not too hard to get. Um, let's see, let's uh, keep going down. You see right around verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament. That's, uh, the firmament is outer space, that's the second heaven. Um, uh, of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. And let them be for lights of the firmament, heaven to give uh, light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set in the firmament of the heaven and gave light upon the earth. Okay? Notice that. All right, I don't know, hopefully that tracks up, gives you enough sound to hear. Or you can just focus on the screen, I don't know that you necessarily need to see me, so you might just leave it where it's at, that's fine. So what's interesting about what I gave you there in Genesis is that what you see is on the first day, God created the earth, right? When did the sun come into the picture? Not until day four. All right, so let's go back here for a second. All right, so he made the earth here. What was the earth doing before this got made? Was it just going around and around and around and around and around what? Wasn't anything there. There's not going to be anything there for three more days. Okay, so just kind of an interesting, if you look at the order of creation, you find that the Lord creates the earth three days before he creates the sun. All right, let's, um, and in uh, Psalms 96.10, he says, uh, talks about that the world, the world shouldn't be moved. Now, you could uh, probably make some claims about uh, the world not being the same thing as the earth. All right, we'll continue to look and see what we find. All right, go to First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30. Let me go back here so you've got that. First Chronicles 16, 30. First Chronicles, I'm um, in Second Chronicles, give me a second. First Chronicles 16.30 uh, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Okay, so there he's told you twice that the earth uh, shouldn't move, doesn't move. Uh, go back to Psalms, Psalms 93.1. Psalms 93, 1, the world, or sorry, the Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty, uh, the Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also is established, that it cannot be moved. All right, are we beginning to see a pattern of what the Lord is saying about the world? All right, uh, 1 Corinthians eight thirteen. 1 Corinthians eight thirteen. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So he talks about the world standing, standeth, uh, uh, unmoved. 
uh, back in Psalms. You could probably just keep a finger in Psalms. We're back in, we're in Psalms quite a bit. Psalms 19. And some of it is, uh, is fairly hard to, you know, if you sit down and you think about it, maybe it's just because I'm not smart enough to understand their explanation of it. But if the earth is something like 24,000 miles in diameter, right? Or sorry, in circumference, correct? So for you to go through a complete day with the sun being stationary, the earth has to be spinning uh, at around approximately 1,000 miles per hour. Okay, so their explanation is that the atmosphere is, uh, because of friction, stays to the earth and rotates at the same rotation that the earth rotates uh, so that you don't wind up with a thousand mile headwind or a thousand mile tailwind. The problem is that you still have wind. You still have uh, a wind that is, you still have a jet stream that's moving at a different speed than what the earth is rotating at at a certain point. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that the earth is rotating a thousand miles per hour and you still have wind at varying speeds. But again, like I said, I'm not that smart. Maybe somebody's got an answer for it. Um, I've got a pastor friend, like I said, that I really respect. And a lot of this, we've sat down and talked about it. And um, his position is, is uh, on a lot of these places, these verses I'm giving you, is that these are uh, speaking poetically. But for me, it speaks so often that I don't know that it can be poetic in every single case. All right, Psalms chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth, under, uh, showeth knowledge. And this is a passage we've looked at before. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. A tabernacle is like another word for a tent. Okay. Uh, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth, uh, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. All right. So the context from the time that uh, you start in here is you're looking at verse 4. Okay. Uh, that last sentence, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So the subject of what he's saying after this is the sun. What he says after it is talking about the sun. All right? Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. How does a man run a race commonly? In a circle. Right? around a track or or even in any you know you go to run a marathon most of the time where do you wind up at where, where's the finish line at same place as the start line right now you will get some races where you start one place and you end someplace totally different but for the most part even in your marathons you wind up right back where you started from that's how a strong man runs a race this and, and what's he talking about he's not talking about the earth He's talking about the sun is as a strong man that runs a race. Notice verse 6. His going forth. Who's going forth? The sun's going forth. So the sun isn't in a stable position. It goes forth. Uh, his going forth is from the end of the heaven. And notice this. And his what? His circuit. Okay. How does the circuit work? It, it goes around, right? A complete circuit. So many of the uh, theologies make the sun out to be, well, I don't even know. His. Now, and the, the major reason for that is, is because the sun 
our son is a similitude of Jesus Christ, and we have references for that. Okay, so it's going to compare the son to Jesus Christ. And a lot of folks have used that as proof for the sun being at the center and the earth rotating because Jesus Christ should be the center of the, of the universe and we just rotate around it. But you don't find that being used that way anywhere in the Bible. You know, what was the center of God's creation? Mankind. He doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't tell you a whole lot. He doesn't really spend any time... You know, like I said, whenever we were looking there in Genesis chapter 1, how much time did he spend talking about the sun to set it up as the center of his creation? He doesn't. He mentions that it's there for one reason, and that's for light, for the day. And he sets up the moon for light for the night, and that's the, that's the grand purpose behind it. Now, granted, here we're in Psalms chapter 19, and he tells you that there's a testimony it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. So the sun utters speech. Uh, it's going forth. Now, uh, back there in verse 6, his going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So even in the end of it, if you lost the context, he gives you the context back at the end, when he's talking about the heat, you know that we're, talking, we're still talking about the sun. He didn't change, he didn't flip subjects somewhere and not tell you about it. So everything that he gave you there showed you that the sun is moving in a circuit. Now, what somebody might say is that, well, the sun is out here somewhere and it's rotating around our galaxy. But, you know, here's the interesting thing about that is that the Lord never spends any time talking about the Milky Way galaxy at all. He tells you about uh, three heavenly bodies. He tells you about the earth, and that's the first. And he spends a lot of time talking about the earth and everything that he puts on it. He tells you about the sun and the moon, and if you want to count a fourth, he says, and I made the stars also. He spends the least amount of time talking about this, because this would be the stars also. So to relay to you that the circuit of the sun is somehow meaning this is lost. So uh, again, you can, you can argue against me on any one of these points, and you're not going to offend me at all. I just think it's interesting on how the Lord writes this and how consistent he is in writing about it. Go to Psalms chapter 104. Psalms chapter 104, we'll look at a few verses here. Let's come back. Psalms 104, uh, look at verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? All right, so up to this point, whenever he's talked about it, he used uh, the word world. And so somebody could uh, probably try to make the argument that when you're talking about the world, you're talking about the world system, but when you're talking about the earth, you're talking about the planet that we're on. And that you might be able to split hairs over whether the world and the earth are being referenced to the same thing. But notice here, who laid the foundation of the, wor of the what? He doesn't say the world, he says the earth. Okay? That it should not be removed forever. So the foundation... Uh, he talks about the foundations of the earth. Now, let me be clear here. I am not, uh, this Bible study is not a claim for a flat earth. I'm talking about a stationary earth, not a flat earth. Okay? All right, let's, um, let's look at verse 19. 19. He appointed the moon for seasons, and notice this about the sun. The sun knoweth his going down. So, again, you have a motion of the sun, but not a motion of the earth. Verse 22, the sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. So he talks about the sun goes down and the sun rises. Now you can make a claim about perspective there, but again, he's continuing to uh, show you the motion of the sun in comparison to the stability and the motionlessness of the earth. All right, we're still in Psalms. Go to Psalms 113.
Psalms 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Again, the sun. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 90. Psalms 119, 90. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou established the earth, and it abideth. Okay, it's not moved. All right. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. Now, I know a lot of you have already uh, are in the process of writing down a bunch of these verses, but um, what I wish I had done, uh, taken the time to do it, is to kind of group some of these things a little bit better by subject. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4, some of them deal with different aspects of the argument. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Now, that doesn't seem like much on its own, it's just that it abides. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 5, uh, five the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down, and notice this, and hasteth to his place where he arose. It goes back and it does the same thing again. It hastens back to its place. All right, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 13. Any questions up to this point? Okay, Isaiah 13. Isaiah chapter 13, um, verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So that's something that's prophetic, but you still have the motion there of the sun. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth. All right, go down to verse 13. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place. Okay, so you're talking about something that's prophetic there, but the implication is, is that the earth has a place. And that one day he's going to move it out of its place. Okay, well something that is in constant rotation, in constant movement, has no certain place. It's moving. Okay, um, the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. All right, uh, Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37, verse 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, and he had heard, uh, maybe I've got the wrong reference there, because I don't find anything in Isaiah 37, 8. Uh, I might have written something down wrong. All right, let's, uh, we'll go to Joshua, sorry. Uh, Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, and things get a little interesting here. Joshua chapter 10, and uh, we'll look at verses 12 through 13. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Notice how many times that's referenced. Okay. But, and get this in verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, who said? Joshua said. Joshua says this, he said, in the sight of Israel, son, stand now still upon Gibeon. You know what the Lord doesn't do? The Lord doesn't correct Joshua and say, Joshua, you don't understand the motions of the heavens. What you're actually asking me to do is stop the rotation of the earth so it appears that the sun stands still. But really, it does this. You know what he does? He answers him according to the prayer. He doesn't correct him. Now, Right? I mean, you're talking about the whole earth, or uh, the, the sun itself, standing still 
um, for a span of time here. And notice it says, hasted not to go down about how long? How long did the sun stay there? About a whole day. Well, that's quite a deal. Now, eventually I'll probably go back and find it, but uh, I remember reading, and I think Dad remembers this. It was, uh, I don't know if it was NASA or who it was, but they were trying to calculate how to get to either Mars or the moon or someplace like that. In order to do that, they had to work everything backwards to predict where the moon would be when they needed to be there. And what they found out is that it, it wasn't where it should be. And they went back and they factored in two events. They factored in, um, well, what they ended up finding out is that when you factor in this right here with Joshua and you factor in the event with Hezekiah where uh, the sun went backwards, that suddenly the planetary motions were where they were supposed to be whenever they worked it all back. I'd have to go back and find it. But in any case, what's interesting to me is that Joshua's long day isn't just recorded in the Bible. Um, it's recorded around the world. And this is, uh, like I said, there's some of this information from this Dr. Bo, if I'm pronouncing his name right, goes beyond just the physics. Um, having concluded that Joshua's long day is a miracle, we may ask whether or not it was restricted just to the area of Canaan. Well, it really couldn't be, right? You can't have the sun standing still in one place on the earth and it continues to go down in some other place in the earth, right? Um, or whether it's a global in scope. It should be global in scope. Certainly a missing day would generate considerable consternation among the peoples of the world provided it was a global event, and it would have to be. Uh, are there other accounts of a long day or even a long night? Because if you're on the other side of the planet, you're not going to get a long day. You're going to have a night that goes for a whole day. All right? So Joshua's long day in Africa. Uh, towards the end of the last century, Charles Adil Lewis uh, Toten, uh, then a retired professor of military science from Yale University, published a controversial study on Joshua's long day. The book dealt extensively with Joshua's long day and Hezekiah's sign. In recent times, attempts to discredit it center more on the person of Toten than they do on the mathematics and science involved. Toten was the editor of a publication called Our Race, devoted to the promotion of what today is called British Israelitism, which isn't good doctrine. Although Toten's stance is eminently more realistic and moderate than that taken of, uh, by that faction today, Robert Olden says Toten obtained most of his material from J.B. Dimbley. I'm going to see if I can fast forward here. Uh, into some stuff actually dealing with Africa. Uh, you have uh, several accounts, though. Uh, there's an Egyptian account. We find that the French classical scholar Ferdinand Com uh, Combrete translated some Egyptian hieroglyphs which tell of Joshua's long day. The text starts out with an edict uh, from the king to exempt from taxation those who have been victims of a flood some two weeks earlier Evidently, the flood had been caused by an unusually high tide, because what else stopped? He mentions not only the sun. Um, I'm trying to see get back here. So the, let's see. Sun stand now still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Well, uh, what does the moon affect? It affects your tides. If the moon doesn't move, then you get a consistent inward tide. And so you have an exemption in Egypt uh, by people experiencing uh, incredibly long tides. Evidently the flood had been caused by unusually high tide. The cause according to Egyptian hieroglyphs was this. The sun thrown into confusion had remained low on the horizon and by not rising had spread terror among the great doctors. Two days had been rolled into one. The morning was lengthened to one and a half times the normal period of effective daylight. A certain time after this divine phenomenon, the master had an image built to keep further misfortune from the country. Uh, Hippiostos, grant protection to your worshipers, prevent the words of these foreign travelers from having any effect. They are imposters, and he goes on and says a whole bunch of other things. They talk about Ramses. But the tide which had risen high overflowed into the plains where the herds were grazing. The cattle drowned represented half the herds of lower Egypt and goes on. So Egypt, Egypt experienced some problems with this. Um, 
but also there's an account in China. The second secular source about Joshua's long day, which was mentioned, in, uh, mentioned by Toten, is uh, based on what seems to be a recently lost ancient Chinese manuscript. In 1810, Gill presents the account. In the Chinese history, it is reported that in the time of the seventh emperor, Yao, the sun did not set for 10 days, uh, and that men were afraid the world would be burnt, and there were great fires at that time, and though the time of the sun standing still were enlarged beyond the bounds of truth, yet it seems to refer to this fact and was manifestly about the same time for the, this miracle was wrought in the year of the world, uh, 2554, which fell in the 75th or some say the 67th year of the emperor's reign who reigned 90 years. So it ends up, uh, China ends up talking about the same event. Now they exaggerated out to about 10 days, but the time span comes out to about the same, uh, uh, same thing. It's also reported in North America uh, you have a long night being reported in Central and South America. Um, you have a long sunset being reported. You have an extra long night being reported uh, in Hawaii. Um, and, and you have some stuff uh, being, well, and I could probably, uh, if you ever wanted to borrow this book, I don't want to chew up all our time talking about all the different accounts that are recorded. And that's just what Joshua's long day. Now, what I also have here, we might, you, know, you can look at it, but Hezekiah's sign, um, where the sun's being rolled back 10 degrees. Um, that is reported in India. It's reported in China. It's reported in North America. It's reported in Central and South America. And there are other accounts as well. So these astronomical events weren't just recorded in the Bible. If they happened, they ought to be reported somewhere else by somebody else. And they were. All right. In, I, this is to me this is why this is interesting stuff I know it doesn't affect your salvation doesn't affect a lot of things but it's interesting all right uh, let's see um, Habakkuk Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 11 Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 11 Habakkuk is uh, right before Zephaniah if that helps you out right after uh, Nahum. Okay, it's in your Minor Prophets. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 11. It says, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Uh, at the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Okay, so he talks about the sun and moon stood still in their habitation, and that's something different. Something's changed there. Uh, go back to First Chronicles. First Chronicles 16.30. Oh, I've already read that one, haven't I? We've already looked at that one. Uh, go to 2 Samuel 22, 16. Second Samuel 22, 16. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. So what we should start to see in here is what the how the Lord is going to start referring to the earth, and He's going to start referring it uh, to its foundations and its place in terms of Him is as His footstool. And a footstool is something that's stationary. Okay, let's go to Psalms eighteen fifteen. Psalms 18, 15. Then the channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostril. So it's cross-reference is being quoted there. All right, Job chapter 9, verse 6. Job 9, 6. Which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Right? It has a place. Uh, Psalms 99.1. Psalms 99.1. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. So uh, you begin to see this prophecy being mentioned over and over again about the Lord moving the earth. 
Uh, Isaiah 13, 13. We've already read that one as well. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, verses 19 and 20. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Again, prophetic. Uh, Job 38. Get you going back and forth between Job and Psalms. Uh, Job 38. Four through six. Uh, where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it, which matched up with what we saw in Psalms, uh, the line of it? Uh, whereupon uh, are the foundations thereof fastened? And, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? All right, so you talk about something that has a foundation and it also has a cornerstone. Uh, the earth is likened unto a building that has a foundation and it has a cornerstone. Again, uh, buildings are not something that you really want moving. It's stationary. All right, uh, back to, let's see, we're in Job 38, Isaiah 40, 22, if we haven't read that one already. Isaiah 40, 22. Uh, he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. All right, so uh, that's a good one, just I mean, showing that the word is, uh, that the, uh, the Bible gives you indication that the world is spherical, uh, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And that matches up with how we've shown the structure of the universe as a curtain. Uh, but you notice that it says that he sits upon the circle of the earth. All right, heading to 2 Kings. Second Kings 32. Oh, there's no 2 Kings 32. 20, 2 Kings 20. I'm sorry. I'm looking at two different references. 2 Kings 20. 9 through 11, it says, uh, And Isaiah said, The sign that thou shalt have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken, shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return back 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. All right, so uh, he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily talk directly about the motions of the planets, uh, but your indication there is he's moving the sun back. Uh, you'll have the same reference, I believe, in Second Chronicles 32, 24. We don't necessarily need to go there. Um, have we already looked at Isaiah? Maybe we haven't. Isaiah 38. Yeah, you have the same thing in Isaiah. Um, and it shall be a sign for thee, for the Lord. The Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down. Notice this in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees. You have a little bit more of it being told there than what he says in 2 Kings. He says the sun uh, return 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. The sun had gone down. Uh, let's see, I want to go back to one of these. Might be worth. Yeah. 
Um, going back to Joshua's long day, it's reported here in the late 1970s, so this may fill in what we were talking about. Uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, two stories appeared in print about a computer finding a missing day. Uh, the first is told by Harold Hill in his book, How to Live, uh, Live Like a King's Kid. In Hill's own words, it says, when NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center here at Greenbelt, um, I think it's Maryland, uh, first went on the air, a horrendous technical boo-boo surfaced, causing a complete shutdown uh, of the computer after less than an hour's operation. I was called in as an outside consultant, came up with a quick fix that saved the day for them. After things fired up, I stayed around as an interested observer to catch the very beginning of our space exploration activity uh, that was somewhere back in the 60s. A large team of IBM technicians was present to debug the system and get it running. No one really knew much except that it looked okay on paper. It was during that time I heard about the uh, aberration in the location of the heavenly bodies that led to the Bible account of how the missing day incident came about. I was not the one who came up with the Bible answer, nor do I know the names of those involved. I simply reported it and came uh, as it came to me and used it in my lectures on the Bible and science, which I frequently deliver in schools and colleges in science seminars. A newspaper reported in Spencer, Indiana, Catherine Bryan, 1970, came across a copy and fed it into the major news, science, uh, news services. To date, I've received over 10,000 letters from all parts of the world. Uh, many have correctly pointed out that computers do not stop and put up a red flag. Some have reported that Hill has retracted his story, but that's not true. Hill still uh, maintains its veracity, even though NASA has discovered, has disavowed any and all knowledge of him, and others have charged him with various degrees of fraud. But they had problems with their computer, and the missing day in Joshua, the extra long day, solved it. A second computer account of a missing day appeared in the Swedish Goatsburg, Tinnanen, uh, in March 15, 1981. According to that story, Stig Flodmark of the University of Stockholm had discovered that the Earth's axis had flipped on May 3rd, 1375 BC, and associated that it was Joshua's long day. This proposal is the same as that of Rand, who was mentioned earlier in the chapter. According to Flodmark, an Ugaritic astronomer described the event and gave the date. Flodmark refers to a book entitled uh, Tidal Friction in Earth's Rotation. The comment by the author of the quoted paper uh, is summarized. Uh, sun put to shame went down, in a, went down in daytime. This hardly describes a, a tippy top phenomenon, especially with Gibbon at the rotational North Pole for the day. Uh, for the sun would have been a uh, circumpolar for the Ugaritic astronomer. It would not have gone down in a daytime. But in any case, uh, you have some cases where they're dealing with computers and these things, and the answer is found in the Bible. All right. Uh, we're getting close here to the end of this. Uh, judges. Judges. Uh, judges chapter 5. Judges chapter 5, verse 31. Uh, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land rest, and the land had rest forty years. Okay, Malachi chapter four, verse two, last book in your Old Testament. Malachi chapter four, verse two. Malachi four two. Uh, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So he compares you um, unto the fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth. All right, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. So just a book over, Zechariah 12, 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel saith the Lord which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Foundation of the earth. Uh, Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest? 
okay? The earth is a footstool. Acts chapter, oh, before we leave uh, Isaiah here, let's go down to uh, Isaiah 60, 20, not far from where we are. Isaiah 60, 20, the sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself. So it's, uh, why does he say, it says no more, and we've already looked at some of these references, but in order to say no more must mean that it, that's what it does. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. And finally, Acts chapter 7, verse 49. Acts 7, 49, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my arrest? So cross-referencing those as being quotations. So that's, uh, as far as I know, there might be more references that I've missed. Um, we didn't skip very many of them, I don't think, and unfortunately I should have done some proof checking to see if I had any duplicates. I had some duplicates in here, so it's a little bit shorter list than what this is showing. But um, indication after indication that the Lord is giving is that the earth is stationary, has a foundation, um, has a cornerstone, is a footstool. Uh, the sun, arise, uh, sun rises, the sun sets. Uh, it's as a strong man that runneth a race. It has a circuit. And so it appears that the, according to the Bible that the sun goes around the earth and not the other way around. And I gave you some uh, scientific evidence that they're not saying uh, what we're saying here, but what they are saying is that they don't know about gravity, which is the principle by which they're describing the reason why the earth would go around the sun is because the sun has gr greater gravity, but now they're admitting that they don't know about gravity what they thought that they knew. So there may not be as much truth to either of these two images than what has been told by these guys. And these are all Roman Catholic astronomers. And so that's why whenever we're looking at this guy, is this guy somebody really that we want to hang our hat on? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem to be. Um, you start looking at some things in the guy's personal life that they're not, they're not real great. <laughs> and so you kind of see somewhat of an impact. But the um, question is, is, you know, that you ought to spend some time on the factual side of things, uh, and you'll repeatedly see that Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler are given great credit for disproving the quote-unquote archaic King James Bible, which plainly says that the earth is not moving. Um, I don't know how many references. I guess I probably have over eight references to a stationary earth. More than that, a revolving sun. Uh, I think you have eight references in Psalms alone. Uh, to this day, science falsely so-called, according to 1 Timothy 6.20, relishes the idea that the King James Bible was proven to be scientifically inaccurate in its cosmology 245 years before Charles Darwin, quote-unquote, proved it to be scientifically inaccurate in its geology, biology, and taxonomy. The one step of apostasy necessarily preceded the other. You had this, and then you get Darwin. You get these guys, and then Darwin comes next. In 1500 A.D., you could not find a Bible-believing Christian who believed that the earth went around the sun in 1500. And now, just as in, 18, uh, and, and just as in 1800, you could not find a saved evolutionist. But what do we have today? You've got Bible-believing Christians that 99.99% .99 of them believe that, but they believe what this guy said. Not what this says. And so they go with it. And now you have, uh, you know, um, theistic evolution. You know, th this idea that we can find room for evolution in the Bible so that we can marry the two together so that I don't, you know, have to feel like I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's, that's how it's being done today. It's... Um, if I can't get the Bible to reconcile with science, I'll take the science and try to manipulate the Bible to get it to fit. And if it won't fit, I guess we'll just go with science. Quote, unquote, science falsely so-called. So I know that it's not 
you know, maybe anything major to you. I think it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm interested in anything that kind of uh, points out where I might have been taught something that wasn't right. And trying to figure out, okay, if I'm a Bible believer, where do I stand on these things? So, anyway, with that, I know it's not preaching, and it's maybe not the teaching that you're super interested in, but uh, I don't know. We'll go ahead and close there. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord God, thank you for this evening that you've given us. Lord, again, we pray that you be with those, uh, uh, those on this youth trip. Uh, Lord, that you watch over them. Pray you be with these little ones uh, out at VBS. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you do a mighty work in both those places, God. Oh, Lord, that, uh, to see souls saved and lives changed. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this book. Uh, this book that, uh, Lord, even if I'm wrong on these things, Lord, this book is such a fascinating book. Lord, it is something that should continually, no matter uh, what it says versus whatever science says, should be our final authority for all matters of faith and practice. Whatever this book says, Lord, uh, I believe it. I believe it even if it doesn't make sense to me. I believe it if uh, all the world uh, teaches against it. Uh, Lord, I'll stand with the book. And Lord, I pray that as a church, that's where our stand is, is that we'll stay with the book. These things I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Any questions?